All right, I guess we'll get started since it's 10 after. So uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome to day two of our five-part uh, Noble Lecture Series for this year. Uh, today's talk is titled, NASA's Orbiting Carbon Observatories, Finding That One in a Million. And it's my pleasure again uh, to introduce the speaker for this year, Dr. Anne-Marie Eldring. As my co colleague, John Paul, touched on on yesterday's introduction, uh, <clears throat> Dr. Eldring has had an extremely impressive career and has been involved in a broad range of instrumentation projects. Uh, over her more than 20 years at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory at Caltech, um, she's uh, overseen the development, validation, and operation of many spaceborne instruments, including the Atmospheric Infrared Sounder, or AIRS, on NASA's Aqua Satellite, the Tropospheric Emission Spectrometer, or TESS, on NASA's Aura, the Orbiting Carbon Observatory 2, or OCO2, and most recently, the Orbiting Carbon Observatory 3 on board the International Space Station. The former instruments have helped to improve our understanding of atmospheric chemistry and composition, while the latter instruments have helped to uh, improve our measurements of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and improve our understanding of the uh, global carbon cycle. Uh, so NASA's Orbiting Carbon Observatories will be the focus of Dr. Eldring's talk today, and with that, I will hand the floor over to her. So would everyone please welcome, uh, join me in welcoming her once again. Thank you for that intro and thanks everybody for coming along for another lecture. Are we okay with the sound in the back? Need it? Okay, good. Um, so th yeah, thanks again. I'm super happy to be here in Toronto. It's exciting to see my old friends and colleagues and then meet folks who we've written papers together but not hang out a lot in person. Uh, plus we got to take in a good Yankees Blue Jay game last night. I will say no more about that. So. <laughs> um, so yeah, we're going to talk a little bit about finding that one in a million, trying to be a little playful with the titles here, but that's really talking about the kind of uh, levels of concentration we're looking for with our carbon dioxide measurements, uh, which is a bit of a challenge with this program. So a little roadmap for today, let's see if this works. <clears throat> 
a little roadmap for today. I'm going to I'll cover a little bit again of the carbon cycle just to get everybody on the same page. And then I'm going to dive into the details of these satellite missions we've worked on, the Orbit and Carbon Observatory, talk a little bit about the technical insides of the thing uh, and what we do with all that data when we get it down. Talk a little bit about OCO3 and what was different and interesting and difficult about that project, uh, as well as a, a, just a couple slides looking ahead. So we're getting a little bit into the instrumentation today. Uh, as a different point of conversation. Just a reminder, in the big picture of carbon cycle uh, science, we burn carbon-based uh, fuels like coal, oil, gas. Atmosphere ends up holding on to about half of what we put in there, and the land and the ocean are taking out about a quarter each on average these days. So we're uh, benefiting from that additional absorption so it slows down the rate of growth in the atmosphere. Uh, and we have a lot of information from some of these remote stations like the Keeling Curve, which is taken on Mauna Loa, shows us seasonality, shows us the growth over time. Uh, we're up at about 420 parts per million today and growth rates two to three parts per million. So you can see if all you wanted to know is how much it grew, you're talking two parts per million out of 400. And you might think, well, that's pretty doable. But when you use satellites, like when we look for ozone, and you wanna see where there's an ozone episode. I mean, we're talking double, triple, many times the amount of background ozone, same for carbon monoxide. So this is not a case of looking for a 20, 30 or 40% increase. You're looking for a half a percent, a quarter of a percent, which is a little bit crazy for space-based, but I'll try to convince you we actually can do that. Um, and again, overall in the carbon cycle, we're looking at these exchanges and flows. There's also, um, massive reservoirs of carbon. A lot of people spend a lot of time looking at the different elements of the carbon cycle to try to put together this deeper understanding. So also we're on the data science collection. We work with some people who do carbon cycle science, but that's a whole uh, massive world of knowledge and development. And again, the, the time is one aspect, the space is another. So when we say, oh, the lands take up about a quarter of what we emitted, which lands is that all? happening in Siberia? Is it only the tropics? It's not the same every year. It's different over the season. So there's a lot of uh, spatial detail that's also part of these questions. So that's why satellites were a motivation because we could see a broader picture of the world, perhaps less precisely, but at least you start to get that global view of things. Um, and again, this is what I was harping on yesterday that one part per million is a little tough to do but if I'm trying to find a gigaton of carbon and we, we emit 40 gigatons a year and I'm looking for one gigaton, I need to note a 0.13 part per million. So really to try to get to some of the details of processes, you have to have a lot of precision in the information. So uh, again, I think I sold you yesterday on satellites are a nice way to try to look at things because if you're using the ground-based stations and you have seasonal and temporal changes, you have limited insight into what's happening. Although the ground-based stations are really very precise and so there's a lot of benefit from that aspect of things. Uh, and going to space gives you this new global vantage point. Uh, a few other numbers to remember, it takes us about um, 15 orbits to get around the earth in a day. And if you fly those orbit tracks after 16 days, you get back to where you started. So in a 16 day period, we get not quite that complete picture on the right, but you've come back around to where you were. These are all using ridiculously expanded footprint drawings so you can see something on my picture. Um, and we collect a million radiant spectra. That's another good thing to keep in your mind, a million a day. Some of you experimentalists will be like, oh yeah, that's a lot of data but we have to toss a lot for cloudiness. We end up providing the science community about 100,000 measurements of carbon dioxide per day. So let's get into the fun. Who loves spectroscopy? There we go. All right, I knew I'd get some, get some folks here. So spectroscopy is at the heart of what we do. How can we find out anything about a molecule? Well, those interactions they have with light are key. I put up hydrogen, a nice simple molecule. There's just a few lines. It's like, oh yeah, I can see how those four different lines of absorption might help me learn about the hydrogen. Carbon dioxide, remember the whole vibrational, rotational, what mode is it doing? Chip Miller has a little dance, which I'm not gonna repeat, but 
Carbon dioxide, even though we've only got a carbon and two oxygens, it's much more complex in its interactions with light. And so this is one of the bands I'm showing up there in the upper left of the absorption features of the carbon dioxide. And if you zoom in to just, uh, just a one and a half nanometers, you can see four particular absorption lines. So those are the features we want. And the fact that there's many of them of different strengths is a real benefit because then you can learn a little, like you can learn about light that's um, being absorbed strongly. You can learn about light that's being absorbed weakly. And I'm sure Kim has given you all lectures on line shape profiles, whether we need a void or whether we need speed dependent, something or other. So there's a lot of details to learn if you can measure well enough to see all of that shape and detail. So the spectroscopy is a key to what we do, the fundamental idea behind these measurements. So I know these molecules absorb light. Can I measure that from space with enough detail to learn about what I'm at? And that's the basic principle of this instrument. It's using reflected sunlight. So you see over on the left, the idea of sunlight coming down back up through the atmosphere. If Deborah was drawing that picture, she would just put something on the ground and look straight at the sun. So we kind of say that TCON stations do half of the light path that the uh, satellites do. That's why they're very valuable for comparison. So we do these measurements, use the spectroscopy, so the upper panel there is the oxygen band that's very useful for how much, um, how much light did I look through when you're looking at the sea surface versus 3000 meters, you have a different light path and you can learn about that just by counting your oxygen molecules. If you're looking on a cloudy day and the light scattered all over the place, that's also going to change what it looks like. So the oxygen band is important for kind of what I look through. And then you see two different bands here where our carbon dioxide is specifically absorbing. And the middle one we call a weak because it's not as deep. And then here you see areas where light's completely absorbed in the 2.1 micron band. So that's that variety of uh, line depths, variety of pressure temperature dependencies, and all of that information is important to pulling out uh, these measurements. So that's the concept, but why is it so hard? Why is this like an exciting space mission? Well, a minute, let me just try to fix my screen for a second here. Do, do, do. All right, not gonna happen. Oh, wait, there we go. Okay, so why is this so exciting? Why is this so hard? Well, when you go up into space, it's not a friendly atmosphere there. There's radiation all over. It gets quite cold and quite warm. Uh, when you can, when you put an instrument in space, you can't go fix it. How many of you fix your experimental setup like once a week, right? We have to realign something, you gotta update the electronics. We can't do that. Plus it launches us, right? So imagine being strapped to a rocket and getting up in space. So all of those things you have to manage if you want to measure from space. Um, sorry. And all right, that was my clicker. Okay, so it's hard because there's a lot of uh, risk with space. And then also it's not a, been a cheap thing to do. So this is kind of a cool graphic I found because I had heard somebody tell me this, you know, the cost per kilogram is, is really high and it's not really going down. And this is a figure that aerospace had put together on the left is showing cost per kilogram. Um, and then the timeline from the 19, late 1980s into 2020s. And they've got three different bubbles for big missions and little missions. But the argument here is you're paying about the same to get a kilogram of stuff up into space. So if the cost isn't going down, maybe the advantage you wanna have is the weight going down, right? So we used to put up things that were just tons of, tons of kilograms. Uh, and now we put up these smaller satellites. And another way of seeing that is the figure on the right, which is a little bit of an eye chart, but in 2016, it's saying that we launched, we as the world launched about 365 kilograms of, um, 365,000 kilograms of stuff into space in these blue markers saying it's kind of large and medium-sized missions. 
And what have you heard about things that we launched to space? What are some of the new space things you're hearing about? Like Starlink and OneWeb. So you have all these microsatellites going up. So up in the top figure in 2020, the launch uh, mass was 550,000 um, kilograms, but you can see it's a ton of little dots. And SpaceX and OneWeb sent up three out of every four spacecraft. So we're having this transformation from these infrequent massive launches to more frequent lighter. The growth of the amount of stuff we launch is, is happening uh, although the 2016, 17, 18 were all on the order of 300 and something thousand uh, kilograms, it's gone up a lot in the last year. But we're going from big ones to little ones on the whole. Less true for NASA based science, but in the whole space program, that's kind of the way it is. Uh, so we don't make it that much cheaper. But if we make it smaller, you think about it, if you've got $100 million and you could launch one big thing, or maybe you could launch 40 little things. That's a different way of doing this work. So, but where did my slide go? Okay, I have another one I'll talk on later, I think. All right, so let's talk a little bit about um, the details of how this happened. So I mentioned spectroscopy, spectroscopy, you want a spectrometer. This is kind of the basic layout of what our OCO instrument is. So we gather light through a telescope, bring it back to a collimator to get parallel beams, use a diffraction grating to separate it, focus that light and collect it on a detector. Uh, so you're probably familiar with this kind of instrumentation, but I thought I'd talk a little bit about the actual details of how this is happening. So telescopes you're probably all familiar with, you maybe looked at the planets through one, but you think about our satellite and uh, it can't be a massive thing, right? So you need a smaller design and this is where these other ideas like these Cassegrain telescopes are important. And this is a, some cool illustrations I found on the internet of a guy who's all into telescopes, but just showing you the general size comparison of a refractor versus the Cassegrain. So we have to use the more compact designs in our space mission, uh, again, to keep the weight and the volume of the thing down. But that's, that's not a technology barrier uh, for sure. That's pretty straightforward part of building these things. Um, and then the grading is another piece of it. So you're probably familiar with prisms and even with gratings as a way of taking in light and then separating out the wavelengths. The trick is people want more and more spectral information. As you'll see in my whole series of talks, you sort of have the FTI as one uh, methodology for making remote sensing measurements. And one of the benefits of Fourier transform spectrometers is they can get very good spectral resolution but now folks are trying to do a lot with the grading instruments, some of the other benefits they offer. But as you try to beat down in a really high spectral resolution, that gets tricky to do. Although in JPL, we've got a micro devices lab. And so some people just spend their time figuring out how to manufacture very uh, precise, well-characterized and, and uh, excellent performance gradings. So that's changed, I think, in the time I've worked in the missions, right, to go from the old technology, new technology, just in the grading design. And detectors are another area of rapid development, right? You may all be too young to have grown up with film cameras. Now you just whip out your cell phone and you've got how many megapixels on that thing. So we've all benefited from detectors becoming more affordable, more capable. And we have for space, although again, the radiation and temperature issue means we generally don't just take the best commercial technology and slap it onto a spacecraft. It has to be maybe radiation hardened or tested in radiation. Um, but the speeds or the electronics, I mean, it, I was talking to some of the folks who work in microwave spectrometry and their instrument that went into space about 20 years ago, basically one guy had to do this whole wiring from the detector system to the electronics to get the data out. And now you just buy a package detector with electronic readout, et cetera. So this advances have really, again, helped us reduce that kilogram per instrument because you can get small, uh, small materials. Some of the folks I think in the like for Planet Lab that I'll talk about in uh, next tomorrow, think they're more a risk taker. So they will try commercial stuff. And again, if 
they want to um, only spend a million dollars on each thing they build, they can take a commercial part, it fails pretty quick. So then they just put up another one. So you do a lot of cheap stuff that might die quickly versus NASA's always had this very risk averse, let me test design, retest, certify, qualify control. So we really tend to spend a lot of money on something very unlikely to fail. So two different models of like manufacturing of spacecrafts. And then how we actually get this data out. So we have, um, we have this detector, we're flying along through space. Um, and then we were looking down at the ground and on this detector, um, we, collect, we collected the data across the row and we actually aggregated a bit to get better signal to noise. So we aggregate across the row to get those eight footprints that are drawn on there. And then the data is being read out continuously. So you start on one side of the detector and go to another. So the, the ge geometry it draws on the ground in this, is this parallelogram because it started on one side and ended at the other. So the time of the beginning on the first footprint and the end of the other one is offset by a third of a second in our case. So there's a little parallelogram that happens. Um, and this is what things look like if you're straight down from the spacecraft. If we look off to the glint or the spacecraft rotated, the shapes of those footprints on the ground will change. But roughly for OCO2, um, that's the geometry where 10 kilometer wide, broken it up into eight footprints. And then the distance down track is determined by the speed of the spacecraft. Um, and that we, you know, two by two kilometer is a pretty, um, pretty good size footprint for the type of data that we collected, especially when we started this experiment. But how good is that measurement? So we must have a few experimentalists in the room. You wanna know your radiance measurements are calibrated, right? So you probably have some light sources you use or detector things. Well, we need to do the same thing. We need to understand the data to be able to interpret it. So it's gotta be well calibrated. And again, when you're on the ground, that's like, that's not too hard to do. We actually get NIST, our National Institute of Standards and Technology to bring an integrating sphere over when we do ground testing as we develop an instrument. So they can help us understand exactly what the radiometry, how many detector counts do I get when I put a known amount of light in? Well, that's all fine and good, but then I launch that thing up to space, I expose it to radiation. Is it gonna stay the same? Is it gonna be consistent in time? So we build a calibration system and we have a few different approaches, which in the end is really needed to uh, differentiate instrument changes from uh, calibration system changes. So we have lamps, but the lamps, even though they're space qualified, we buy hundreds of them and test them out and pick the good ones. They still age and they tend to change a little bit in illumination. Uh, we've got a solar measurement, but it's through a baffle and that's exposed to radiation. And we have a lunar measurement. So those are the three types of data. And it's been really interesting to see the team parse that out with the OCO2 measurements. Um, and this is, I'm going to take a minute to explain this a little bit. So OCO2 got up into space. We had been planning and planning for years. Um, and as I'll show you a little bit later, we have different modes. We can look straight down and measure right below us called Nader. We can look off to the bright glint spot and that helps us with ocean data. And the plan going in was 16 days of Nader, 16 days of glint, because we knew that we get repeat back to our orbit. So that seemed like a straightforward way to get both Nader and glint data. So we did that. And in the early days of the mission, we were switching modes of our measurements. So you can't really see this, but it's showing 16 days of Nader, 16 days of Glint, 16 days of Nader. Well, guess what? The temperature changes were much more important than anyone had anticipated. Our calibration team had a plan. Okay, we're gonna measure this, we're gonna measure that. Those coefficients are known, they stay fixed for like at least a month or six months. Didn't work that way. So we discovered in the early times of the mission that going Nader 16, Glint 16 wasn't a great idea. So we, and we had some other things going on. So it was a messy, messy time at the start of the mission is my main point. Very messy time where we figured out how the thing worked. Then we changed our approach and we interleaved where we had like a few Nader, a few Glint, 
balanced our thermal system, got us a better collection of data. But we found that as we measured the sun in the three detectors, so the blue is the A band where your eyes see, the red and the green are those CO2 bands. If we looked at the sun, we saw this reduction in signal. But if we warm the whole thing up, we could regain our signal. And what we figured out was happening is we had built this instrument, we had to store it for a while because we didn't have the money to launch. And there was some water that was inside of that instrument. So you go to space, you cool your detectors down and what happens to the water? It makes a very, very, very thin sheet of ice on the detector. And it happened to be at just the right thickness that the way it interacted with the light was like as bad as it could be. So you got this reduction of signal as the ice was building up, cook it off by heating everything up, you recover and on we go. So we have to do these decon cycles to get the ice out of the system. As you got later in the mission, you could see that you had to do that less often. So it's getting out of the system. It's only once a year now, again, completely unanticipated. And as you start looking at this data and you're like, what is going on? And people who come up with these ideas, this is what I love about science. We would have all this data, we'd be like, what's going on? And somebody would be like, I think this could explain it. And your first reaction was almost always like, what? And then you start thinking through it and looking at the data and you're like, oh yeah. So this happened with the icing. And it happened with another problem, which I'm embarrassed to talk about. It's not written on the slides, but I'll tell you verbally <laughs> that this instrument is, it's got polarization sensitivity that you can simplify some aspects of the work you do if you only take in one polarization of light, because looking down on the ground, it scrambles the polarization. It's not an issue, but when I look at that glint spot, think about how your polarized glasses work nice at the beach. So you want to have polarized light sensitivity because the glint polarizes the light. Well, we put this instrument up. We're looking at the native data. Yes, we're looking at the glint data. We're like, what? It does not make any sense. Signal's not what it should be. What's going on? And one of our scientists plots it this way, plots it that way. And he goes, well, what if the instrument was built such that the polarization sensitivity is exactly not what I wanted. It's 90 degrees off of that. Yes, he calls up, goes, I think the instrument polarization sensitivity is not what you wanted. And we're like, what? Look at the data. And sure enough, it's completely consistent with the measurements, completely embarrassing, not a fun period for us. But the good news was the spacecraft and the engineers, you, do you not have any engineer friends or you guys are engineers? When you design something, are there safety factors? Safety factor two here, safety factor two there. What if my model's not good? They had over-engineered the hell out of this thing. So we, instead of flying aligned with the sun, we rotated our spacecraft a little bit. Still got enough sun on our solar panels and we got a little more light in through the polarization sensitivity. So we found a way to operate where we could work with what we had, even though it wasn't our design. But it, I, another one of these times where people just investigated, I love the science mindset where they just threw all assumptions out the window and said, what's the data telling me? And they figured out that indeed the polarization was wrong. So calibration of the instrument's important. And you can see that icing was occurring, unanticipated reduces the signal. So the question is, when we see this reduction over time, how much of that is real? Or I'm looking through the sun through this diffuser because it's too bright to look at directly. Diffuser is probably changing in the light of the space. So how much is the change of the diffuser? How much is the change uh, of the instrument itself? And so our calibration team, I said we had lamps, we have sun, we have lunar. So they um, made adjustments for what they thought uh, they saw with the lamp data and they see this kind of decay. So the A band over the time, um, years from launch, it looks like you maybe lost 14% of your signal, you lost 2% in the other bands. So that was sort of a first cut of what they thought was happening based on the solar and the lamp.
But then we have started using the lunar data and the lunar data is beautiful because you look right through the same optical system with lunar data as you do with the solar data. So you don't have any other decay issues. So as long as the moon hasn't changed or reflection of sunlight on the moon haven't changed, that should be a good signal. Um, and when we first looked at this data, it was really jittery and hard to discern. And you're trying to find one or 2% light loss maybe. Um, and one of the guys spent a lot of time and finally figured out that the spacecraft movement was not as smooth as the model was assuming. And when he accounts for all that jitter of the spacecraft, he gets these figures out and shows that the A-band instrument itself must be degrading uh, a few percent down to maybe 94% of the signal that we originally saw is what we see. So this is like detector performance changes, optics inside the instrument degrade, changes happening inside the instrument that change what you see in response to the same amount of light. So the A bands change a few percent, and then these are the two CO2 bands, uh, and you see very little change in those. But you know, first year or two of the mission, you can imagine that you couldn't figure this out. It really took these longer time spans. So that is the one benefit of the NASA build it big and keep it up for a long time. Some of these calibration and understanding issues can take a long time to develop. All right, so that's my fun on um, calibration issues. So just a few pictures of what this thing actually looked like. So this is the spacecraft. Uh, with the solar panels folded up, you can see a couple of guys standing next to it below the platform. It's bigger than a person, but it's not, it's not even as big as a school bus. Um, and when it's flying around, the solar panels are about the same dimensions as the spacecraft itself. And um, just a little, I don't know how much you ever think about space me mechanics, but you have typical uh, orbits, geostationary, uh, where you basically see the same portion of the Earth all the time, and then these low Earth orbits where you're a few hundred kilometers above the Earth. Um, and again, fun numbers, we're going at 7.8 kilometers per second. So think about that. Think about where you are in some place in Toronto that you want to get to eight kilometers away. Boom, you're there. So it's a fast moving object up in the sky. That's how we can get around Earth in 90 minutes. Uh, and again, it takes about 16 orbits per day to get around. And we were flying in a constellation. So you probably maybe heard of the A-train where this idea that instead of building a massive spacecraft with four instruments, we can have many different spacecrafts and fly them close to each other. And then it might be useful. You can take a NO2 measurement from one instrument and a carbon monoxide from another, et cetera. And we use like the cloud information from MODIS along with the OCO2 data. Um, and again, just for fun, the mechanics of it, OCO2 has been in the front and I, there's a mix of present tense and past tense because some of these are aged, some of them don't have enough fuel to control themselves well, so they drop down. So there's changes happening as this fleet ages. Um, and we have to control ourselves within what we call a control box of 86 seconds. So I can float backwards a little bit, but I can't go more than 86 seconds um, from my designated spot. And the guy who's behind us is 200, um, 207 seconds behind us. So um, we think in time rather than distance just because of the flight mechanics. And there's people that specialize in doing this. So generally this all runs pretty well. Although one of the wrinkles was um, that we have you know, a lot of experience working with the CNES, the space agency in, um, in France, the Italians, ESA, Canadians, Japanese, but the Chinese decided to build a satellite. And at first they thought, well, we really wanna um, get involved in this work and we're just gonna go fly in front of the A-train. So, you know, we're like, well, you don't have that much experience, but you may not be aware for the U.S. we have a um, congressperson who decided that it was really bad for the U.S. space people to work with anyone in China. So we are forbidden from talking directly one-on-one -on -one with the Chinese. So we were like, you guys, this is not going to work for you to fly in formation when you can't talk to us. So eventually they got dissuaded. But the TANSAT, which is basically a replica of OCO2, original intention was to fly with the A-train and be right in there. But they fortunately changed the plan on that. 
Um, and this is just a cool little movie that is showing you how we measure the glint. So the dash line is right below the spacecraft. And then we look off to the side. We need to keep illumination on the solar panel. So you see this gentle rotation that happens in the midst of every orbit so that we keep that solar illumination happening. So uh, there is a lot of pirouetting and movement that happens with the spacecraft as it's flying around. And then our friends with TCON, uh, are not right under every Nader track. So you have to look off track to find them. And we wanna get as much data as we can at a TCON site. So we have a special target mode where we're really just focused on one spot with a little nodding uh, and again, pirouetting. So that's what our space navigation folks are up to. They have to plan out these maneuvers and uh, keep an eye that everything's working well. And it also is becoming a busier and busier space out out there in space. Uh, there's a lot of satellites flying. We showed that chart of all the launches happening, but then there's debris, which is actually quite an issue. Um, some of this is because the practice back in the day was just to let your satellite stay in space after you're done. These days we have to carefully plan to have enough fuel to get ourselves down and burn up in the atmosphere. So you need a disposal plan along with your launch plan. Um, some folks like to demonstrate their strengths. So there's been a few instances of, for example, the Chinese blew up one of their old satellites to show how their missiles work. Kind of, right, it's a quiet threat to everybody. Like if I wanna blow up your stuff, I could, here, watch. And now there's junk all over. And these are some numbers of how many pieces there are, um, right? The number of large pieces is only in the 23,000. You've got pieces the size of a marble, like a half a million of them, and then, 100 million of these tiny things. So there's a lot of debris. There's a piece of our navigation team that just spend their time listening to the reports of what the debris is, how big is it, where is it? Periodically, they have to plan a maneuver to lift ourselves or lower ourselves to get out of the way of junk. Uh, so it's a big issue as we, we get busier with these satellites. And you know, there's things like the Starlink, they're both, astronomers hate some of this stuff because they're putting a lot of reflective things in the sky, but then it's also a big issue with space junk. All right, so we collect a ton of data. We have a whole antenna system that NASA runs to get it back down to the ground. Uh, when you have the A train up there, everybody's one after the other, they're all trying to dump their data. So there's a lot of coordination that has to happen for the data downlink. Look at those numbers, 150, megabits per second. Wow. So that's considered pretty good downlink for what we're doing. <laughs> now, you know, people are trying to up that, but that's what we were doing. Uh, again, satellite stations across the ground, pretty international collaboration to make that happen. So that's not been a real barrier for us. Uh, once we get the data to the ground and our algorithm and validation calibration team can get to work, uh, we basically get ones and zeros, and then we have to turn that into a radiant spectra. Um, and we, right, so there's a spectra you get in the, just the engineering units of the instrument, and then you have to have your calibration factors and turn it into a calibrated radiance, and then the algorithm science teams get to work. And that's where a lot of my time was spent thinking about these issues of how we get a calibrated radiance over to an estimate of carbon dioxide. Um, and I'll show you a few of the details of that problem in the slides that follow. Again, this is, is where I spent a lot of time and also just another comment, you know, this mission was launched saying we can do one part in a million as, as we got our results and started to work. And then the science community is like, that's nice, but how about a half a part per million? <laughs> you know, I'm like, you know, if I want to understand that African regional problem, I need to point two parts per million. So they're never satisfied. We do the best we can. Um, it's been fun actually to see it go from, you can't do this. I think it's working to like, okay, let's see how good we can be. Uh, and again, the spectra is at the heart of it. We're gonna do a fit to this spectra. Um, we use optimal estimation approach and I'm not gonna go through the math. I understand this well enough to have a conversation about it. I do not dream about this stuff or write these equations in my sleep as one of my colleagues, I swear to God does. Um, but what was super fun was when I started back in the day, the TESS instrument was one of the first instruments using these techniques and Clive Rogers was teaching at Oxford and he was part of our team. So I actually got to hang out with Clive Rogers. We got to read his book 
uh, and learn from him. And some of my colleagues were students of his. So we really got to bring this idea in and demonstrate it and use it in our satellite, which was quite fun. Um, and it's a, it's a mathematical approach that you see everywhere. It's the retrieval for a spectra to an XCO2, but it's the same problem you're doing in data assimilation and many other systems. So uh, universally powerful approach. But the, the heartache is turned out to be maybe less so in the, do I have a good radiance calibration, but it's things like the spectroscopy. I'm amazed at how science team meeting after science team meeting, the spectroscopist will be, well, we have this update for the water lines in the O2A band and it really changed, blah, blah, blah. So there's always improvements and there's a lot of new technology for instruments in the lab, like I'll show you some frequency comb stuff, cavity ring down spectrometers, just amazing lab improvements that help along with the spectroscopy improvements. But things like the temperature water vapor profiles are part of the assumptions. Uh, aerosols are just a terrible interference for these measurements. And so what do we know about them? What am I assuming matters? Even the reflectance, if I understand things correctly, one of the latest updates was how we represent cock monk, Cox monks reflectance off the ocean on our retrieval algorithm that's shown an improvement in our data. And the solar spectrum, we've used a old, old solar spectrum and there was an instrument on the space station that collected new data, updated the solar spectrum. We saw improvements in our results. So there's all that supporting information turns out to be important. And we have people whose whole job is to feed the beast of the computer. So you've got, I say we collect a million spectra per day, throw out three quarters of them, you've got 250,000. This still takes a couple minutes to five minutes. I've lost track of the timing, but it takes a while to run that optimal estimation, generate the rated spectra, modify the profile and go through the math. So if we're gonna do that for a quarter of a million per day, we need a lot of CPUs for this thing. Um, and we, we ended up buying a whole bunch. Now we send some of it off to Amazon, but there's computer scientists whose whole worry is, how do I track all that data through the pipes? How do I get it to the right place, package it, do a little QA, QC. So there's a lot of behind the scenes magic. And remember once that thing's in space and you turn it on, you don't get Saturday and Sunday off, right? It's sending data down every day. If you get behind, if you're 10% slow in your data processing, you're hosed after 10 days. So they really uh, have a lot of work and they don't get that much of a spotlight on it, but it's an important part of the processing. And we collect a lot of data. I showed you some maps yesterday. Um, and I will talk more about calibration in some other talks. I'm going to make two points here and then just quickly uh, talk a little bit about OCO3. I think one of the, again, the underappreciated things about the validation data is it's not just a scatter plot and an aggregate comparisons, like what's happening in more detail. And Deborah spent a lot of time early in the mission looking at site by site, data point by data point. When I aggregate information, what is it I'm seeing? Because you have variability across the target. You have different geometry. There's a lot of things to understand at a more detailed level. Uh, and then we make these time series where we compare a whole bunch of sites over time. What are we learning about that? What are the site to site differences telling us? Is there any seasonal variation that I can explain? Why, you know, what's underlying that behavior? And there's been innovation in looking at uh, seasonal cycles from the data sets at the target sites and what that says about um, long-term performance, possible instrumentation issues or not. So new ways of trying to look into these details, help us get some insights. And a few memorable insights were, for example, Mateus Kiel looked at our data and on the upper right, it's showing you a map of the surface altitude for this measurement area. And on the lower is our XCO2. So you're what is that? Uh, not so good, right? There's correlation between the surface altitude and the XEO2. If you just have one dot on your scatter plot for the validation, you're not gonna see that. Gotta look at maps of the data, look at the details. So Mateus found that and we went through a whole bunch of work to actually update the pointing of the satellite. So where it was looking was off by about 0.036 degrees. 
when he figured that out with a lot of analysis of the data, we made a correction and now he could remove that altitude driven bias. So basically it was a pointing error that drove a bias in our XCO2. And people have looked at things like the wind speed, comparing our wind speed in the retrieval to AMSR data. And this led to some insights about the uh, surface reflectance model. So again, it always, uh, we're learning things by diving into the data. In the early panic days, we didn't have time for that, but now we're later in the mission, you can get some insights. Just real quick, so OCO3 is on the International Space Station. There's this Japanese module where you can put things on the outside. Um, and if you're thinking about the space station flying forward, we're up there in the front corner uh, locked in. And we thought, well, this is going to be easy. You can put a lot of stuff up on the space station. They're not very sensitive about the mass of things. So we'll take what we have, put it in a box, build some thermal control. Mostly it was easy, but then there were some, a few wrinkles in the system. We needed to be able to point, and I showed you OCO2 pirouetting and going look at the target. Well, you're not doing that with the space station. So we had to build something that could actually do the pointing. So this is a a mirror, I forgot my tinker toy, but there's, it moves in this plane and it moves in this plane so you can point everywhere you want. But building it, testing it, difficult. And you characterize the pointing and those angles and you do that in the earth on gravity and then you're gonna operate it in space where there's no gravity. So we had to have a whole program or recalibrate in space because there was no way to calibrate this thing uh, to true precision we needed. We also, uh, this is a shot of the container that was gonna get installed on the space station. And you see here in the bottom, these big ugly bars and stuff. That was a late minute addition when we realized, well, SpaceX launch is really affordable, but it's a rough ride compared to what the NASA spacecraft uh, launches are like. So this is a system that has uh, isolators. So they dampen the, shaking and we had put these isolators on and then realized the whole thing was a little bit too tippy and we had to stiffen it with the bar. So ugly, ugly last minute engineering to deal with the vibrations. Uh, then we put it in our testing chamber. Why is it lying upside down? Because you actually bring sunlight down through the test chamber into the instrument as part of the program. Uh, but that gives you some idea what it looks like. And then the, I didn't actually get to see this in, in real life because it got delayed, delayed and I went home. Uh, but we went up in a dragon trunk. This is us locked in on the ground as we get ready, launched, and then that dragon rocket gets separated. Here's the little illumination of the Earth. So it was pretty cool to be on a SpaceX uh, Falcon and the robot arms take us out of there and install us. No human touches it, but they drive the robots, including the Canadian robot arm, uh, to get us installed on the ISS. And we have that pointing system. So I think I showed you some stuff yesterday of the LA measurements that come from that unique capability of the pointing system. So this has been a really neat evolution. Um, we didn't have as much water, so we didn't have the icing problem as bad. We knew the polarization was what the polarization was. So we had some different workarounds. So we benefited a lot on OCO3 from having worked on OCO1. Uh, and seeing cool cities, this is Buenos Aires on a couple different days where you see some hot spots of carbon dioxide. And that's one of the coolest things we do with those CO3, I think. Um, and I am going to stop with Yabrin. We'll talk more tomorrow about things in the future. But OCO2 and OCO3, we weren't the first. The Japanese were the first. But these have been really fun experiments to work on uh, and get new measurements of CO2. So thank you very much. <laughs>